the nonprofit MBA purpose is to provide new business insights and fresh creative ideas for executive directors and their teams that will help them improve their organization. Here is your host, Stephen Holastic. Welcome, everyone. My name is Stephen Holastic. I will be your host for today's nonprofit MBA podcast, as I've been for the last six years. I am co-founder of Financing Solutions, and for those of you who do not know about Financing Solutions, we are the leading provider over the last 13 years of lines of credit for small nonprofits in the United States. Yes, there is a company that specializes in nonprofits, and uh, our product is extremely popular. We have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of clients um, and they honestly love their, I, I, I never had a complaint about somebody not liking their line of credit. So please, uh, if you're interested, please feel free to visit our website for the line of credit. Nonprofitmbapodcast.com is the uh, information you can go to to learn more. We have a sponsor and our sponsor for today's podcast is Arrays Fast Fund Online. It's accounting software specifically made for small to medium sized um, um, uh, nonprofits. And, you know, it's great to have software specifically made for your industry. So I highly recommend it. If you are interested, just go to Arrays.com, A-R-A-I-Z-E.com. It's a heck of a lot better than QuickBooks. Um, again, that's arrays.com. Today, I'm very excited to be speaking with Lori Zoss from Growth Al. And uh, Lori is the founder of CE and CEO of Growth Al, a consultancy based, um, uh, focused on uh, Fortune 1000 engagements for associations, nonprofits, and other purpose driven organizations. With over 23 years of, of expertise in corporate sponsorship support, Fundraising and corporate cause marketing, Lori has established a reputation for exceeding goals and building high performance teams. She is the author of The Boardroom Playbook, a not so ordinary guide to corporate funding for your purpose driven organization. And she has held leadership positions at renowned organizations like PBS, NPR member stations, Clear Channel, and the University of Phoenix. Lori, welcome to today's nonprofit MBA podcast. Thank you. Happy to be here. So, you know, today's uh, topic, corporate sponsorship and corporate philanthropic support for nonprofits. And again, the majority of our listeners are smaller nonprofits. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that most of them are new to the idea of corporate sponsorship and, corp uh, uh, and, and corporate philanthropic, philanthropic support. Um, what is kind of the first step in moving in the direction of a sponsorship? Well, first, it's kind of like the mindset of your own organization. Understand that even though you are a smaller nonprofit, corporations of all sizes may have an interest in helping to support you. It's all about aligning with mutual interests. So many nonprofits that are of small size don't, don't know that many corporations, Fortune 1000s, other larger corporations, they have a vision, value, and mission for community giving and community sponsorship engagement. And if your organization, whether it's a small food bank or a, a smaller nonprofit that helps kids in pre-K or lower, whatever it is, there probably is a corporation somewhere that has an interest in possibly supporting you. So I always like to start with that because I think a lot of organizations think, well, gee, I'm a one or two person nonprofit or I'm a totally volunteer nonprofit. Would, would XYZ Corporation really want to pay attention to me? And the answer is yes. And another big reason for that is corporations are starting to really figure out that a five, ten, fifteen thousand dollar grant or sponsorship support is going to go much longer way for a smaller community-based nonprofit than if they gave that to a much larger multi-million dollar for profit or sorry nonprofit organization that has more of a national footprint. So that's something else to keep in mind. But to go back to your original question, the best way to start is just start to research. You know, research some of the corporations that are in your area. Um, also, just doing a Google search. Again, we'll use the the food insecurity example. Let's say that you're a small food bank. You could just literally Google corporations that support food insecurity 
and you'll start to see a list or Google will serve to you different types of Fortune 1000s, other big companies out there that like to support organizations that are like yours. So it all starts with just some some basic research. Um so the the what do you know is the what did you what do you notice about the smaller nonprofit executive directors? Mm who are successful at getting corporate sponsorship, what do you notice that they do that other ones who are not successful at getting it do? That's an excellent question because a lot of my work is one-on-one with the executive director. Even larger nonprofits don't always have someone that's just dedicated to looking at corporate sponsorship or corporate philanthropy. So it's a phenomenal question. I think executive directors that have an open mind to want to try it. Really, that's that's your best start. I work with all different types of executive executive directors, executive directors who have absolutely no fundraising experience whatsoever, executive directors who maybe have experience in traditional major gifts or plan giving, but have never really engaged corporations and people who are really seasoned and are just looking to hone in their skills. So To me, if you have a willingness to try and a willingness to experiment with different ways to outreach and different types of organizations, and you build in the time to do it, really, those are the key success indicators just to get you started. Yeah, I I, I would think that the executive directors who are just, you know, pushing forward just says, we're going to do it. They're the ones who kind of get it done. Um... And, and the ones who are, are reluctant and scared and, um, you know, scared is not the right way to say it, but, um, they're, you know, they, they kind of don't go for it. I, I guess yeah. that's the, right. Is that fair? Yeah. Do, you, yeah. do you find that it takes a lot of time to do this type of work? You know, no, it, I think it, it, you have in your mind that it's this big mountain, right? When it's really just kind of a little hill. So I like to say to people that I work with, let's focus on five, not 50. So when we're looking at outreaching, let's just pick, even if it's two, let's pick two or five companies for you to really get to know, do some research. Let's find the right decision maker for you and let's build a plan. Let's do one a week for five weeks. And maybe that maybe takes 10 or 15 minutes a week, really, to kind of get the information you need create a message and make the outreach. So there's a lot that can be done literally within minutes every week that you can do um, if you really just focus on smaller goals. And also if you focus on those smaller goals, as you probably know, Stephen, they're much more achievable and you're more apt to want to keep going. Yeah, I find that um, like uh, two two years ago, maybe it was a year ago, I raised... I always thought I could be good at fundraising. Yeah, yeah. And so I, I, I joined this organization, and and I, and I, I went out and, and raised quite a bit of money, and but I, I, it all it does is it takes that first call, yes. doesn't it? Yeah. Like you just got to make that first call, and then it's like, oh, this really wasn't that difficult. Right? Absolutely, yeah. It's kind of like a muscle. The more you do it, you get really good muscle memory for this. No, And the other thing is, too, going back to the importance of the executive director, companies want to talk to you, the executive director. They know that you are the ones that have kind of the boots on the ground. You're seeing what your communities need. uh, And you're the one that sees what the real needs are in terms of internally in your organization. And they like like talking to the head honcho. Uh, So, uh, you know... Partnering up in, in finding the right organizations to speak with, a great way to do it is truly having it come out of the ED's office. It's to, there, there must be a methodology or the steps that you kind of have, and you, you alluded to it already, yeah. you know, doing the research first, um, the script, yeah. uh, you know, uh, the follow up, the yeah. consistency. Yeah. So, so tell me your steps and be, to be very effective at corporate sponsorships. Yeah. So when you are researching and I talked about starting with the website, but, but other places to look on the website besides just the homepage and maybe who the executives are, 
you want to look and see if they have a report to the community, like an annual report, campaign for the community, and see what they're involved in. Because that way, if you, you have specifics of what they're involved in and you can you have a similar connection there, you can reference that. So, you know, when you are outreaching, you can say, oh, I see that you work with ABC Food Bank in the Charlottesville area. We're actually a smaller food bank just outside of Charlottesville. And maybe there is an interest in, in hearing about our support needs. You know, so that's, that's a great way to find connection. And once you do find that connection, when you're reaching out, probably the most popular way to reach out now is via email. My biggest tip is to keep your emails brief and concise, the power of brevity, 200 words or less. Who are you? Why are you contacting them in terms of what your connection is? We find that out in the research phase. And what is it you want next? Do you want a meeting? Do you want the opportunity to send information? Decision makers and corporations respond very well to brief and concise messages. I think the biggest mistake most nonprofits make, all sizes, is the same. They say way too much in that initial email, and then the email either doesn't get read or it just isn't really taken as seriously because the decision maker doesn't know where to go with it. Mm. Yeah. And it's usually most, most of the times it's a multi-pronged approach, right? A yeah. phone call, email follow. Mm-hmm. I think, I think one of the things that's most important is to think, uh, have an attitude that eventually, if you see that your mission aligns with the corporate need. Yes. I think, you know, you have to be like a dog with uh, a bone in its mouth <laughs> yeah. where you're not going to let it go. Right. And that I am eventually going to get this cl- this corporate sponsorship. Now, it might not be this year. It yeah. might not be next year. But I'm going to get them eventually because I believe that their corporate mission and my corporate uh, – our nonprofit's mission are aligned. Yeah. And I think once once you get that and you have that list – and then I guess the next most important thing is consistency. Yes. Right. Consistency of making a, an effort. Um, do you think that people fall apart when it comes to consistency mm. more, or or where do you think their the hiccup typically is? It's usually in in following up. You know, if they'll they'll be very diligent about making the first call or sending the first email or sending an initial message on LinkedIn, which is another great way that that's successful. And if they don't get an answer right away, there's a thought, oh, I failed. This is a journey. You know, corporate support is a long game. And have I had times where myself or my client has, you know, hit it on the, you know, the first hit, you know, first email went out or first call and we got a contact? Yes. But more often than not, it takes three, four, five, six times to reach out before somebody actually responds. You have to understand that corporate decision makers have about 900,000 things going on. So if they don't recognize who you are right away and they're not seeing a familiarity yet, it's going to be glanced over for other things they have going on. So if you stay consistent, eventually they are going to get to your message. The, um, you know, just, uh, this is a while ago, but one of the companies I owned, uh, you know, quite a, uh, 20 years ago was, Mm -hmm you know, something like that. It yeah. was, um, we, our, our main lead generation method was, was, uh, phone calls. Right. Yeah. So, to, mm-hmm. you know, and so, um, I had read this statistic or I learned about it and is out of six calls that you make, the chances that you're going to close a deal on the first call is like 0.01%. Oh yeah. The next, mm-hmm. the second time, and don't hold me to these figures. It's just yeah. it illustri- illustrates a point. The second call is one uh, percent. Mm-hmm. The the third call is two percent. Mm-hmm. The fourth call is five percent, and then the sixth call is thirty mm-hmm. percent. So in my mind, I was like, let's get to that sixth call. Yeah. It, yeah. Because I was like, you know, the probability is in my favor. Yeah. Um, it, as long as now, of course, you want to spread it out and all this other yeah. things. Yeah. But by knowing that the, and, and I like what you said too, and that is, you know, a multi pronged marketing approach. And mm-hmm. you you mentioned, you know, phone call, email, LinkedIn follow up, mm-hmm. you know, uh, 
mailer, you know, uh, you know, custom mail, handwritten notes. Oh yeah. That's you know, a good one. you know, yeah. how could, you know, understanding where the corporation that that company is yeah. and its cycles, you know, mm-hmm. when do they actually decide on corporate sponsorships? Yeah. Knowing, you know, those type of things, no, knowing the key decision makers, knowing what's involved, you know, it's, it's a long game approach. Yes. You need stamina. <laughs> and yeah. to your point, the, you know, this doesn't happen on the first call or the first email. The, the first approach is to get interest. The second is, and once you've once you've made the connection and there's interest, and you get that first meeting, the next the next goal is a second meeting, and that second meeting is either to have a proposal reviewed, a presentation, you know, what have you, and there could be more or less in between that. But if you understand going in that your first outreach is just to establish interest, I think that also takes the pressure off for executive directors that are outreaching that have very, very high expectations of what they should be seeing coming back from in terms of replies or calls back. Remember, it's just, this is a, it's like dating. You're not going to propose on the first date. I'm sure some people do, but (laughs) you know, it really is a matchmaking process. And also don't be afraid of no, you know, there's a, there's a lot of people that just inherently fear rejection I love no, because that lets me move on and not think about if I need to be in this space anymore. It really yeah. does allow me to, to move on. So that fear of rejection is also something I work on with a lot of executive directors. Now, I, I, I do have some personal experience with two nonprofits I'm, that I'm yeah. involved with where executive directors change. Sure. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, it's well known that executive directors typically are changing every two to five years. Yeah. And, and I, you know, I, I, I would guess, and I know that the executive directors, when they actually end up leaving an organization, they might still really care about the cause a lot so that they want to leave if, if, and when they leave, they, they want the work of the organization to continue and be successful. Yes, And so I would think that um, having a good defined process and being able to leave the work that you have done to try to land a a a corporate sponsorship to the Mm -hmm. next executive director, yeah, is really important to the sustainability of the organization. Um, is, is that all fair to say? Absolutely. And first of all, it's just good to do, you know, be, being a good nonprofit executive leader, that's just being good at what you do. But remember, you're also, you're, you're, you're being a farmer, right? You're planting seeds, you're harvesting, you're kind of doing this at the same time. So you might have a great relationship that you, that you kind of planted and got going at nonprofit A. Now you've moved on to nonprofit B and you see a potential match with that, that partner, that corporate partner you were working with. You've already laid the groundwork in terms of relationship. They know you, they trust you, and you could kind of pick it up from there. So it's just, it's also just good business to do that. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that um, regardless if you use just an Excel spreadsheet mm-hmm. or if you use some simple CRM system, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, customer relationship management and, you know, there's plenty of free ones that are out there. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, But even if you just like, I mean, you need to know the person's name you're dealing with. You need to know the last time you called them and what happened. Mm -hmm. The last time a a handwritten letter went out, last time a LinkedIn um, contact was made, you know, keeping good notes. And Mm -hmm. that's why I like your idea of picking five. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's pick five. Let's do the research. Yeah. Let's start the process and let's build the process so that it's not only sustainable yeah. to to me, but it's sustainable to the next executive director. Yeah. Um, regardless if you care about the next executive director or not, I think it'll make your efforts this time around more effective. Is that fair to say? Absolutely. And to your point about the tools, I don't get hung up on what tool you use. If you're someone that prefers an Excel spreadsheet or a Google sheet, that's great. 
If you yep. want a CRM, that's great too. As long as you're keeping track of, to your point, when you're calling, who you spoke with, did you leave a message? Did you get a response? That that also, the, the other reason I like those tools, it shows your progress and makes you feel good about what you've done. Yeah. You know, again, going back to those small achievable goals that you can look at that progress and say, oh, well, I contacted three. I hadn't contacted three last month, so I'm really ahead of the game, right? So that's the other reason I like accountability tools. It's not only accountable for your activity, but it's also a motivator for you about what you've done and to keep you going. What percentage of the time do you find that the executive directors that you're working with are just not, and let's be honest, capable of making fundraising calls? They're just more, they're introverted. They're more service-based mm. toward the organization. Do you find that, you know, you, you know, I'm sure you don't give up on them, but I, I'm, I'm saying, <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. do you ever come to a point where you say, listen, I, I think there probably needs to be somebody else making these calls? I got to be honest, it's rare because yeah. what I try to do with my clients is find a means that works for them within their skill set. So honestly, although I'm very extroverted and, and I've been making sales calls for years, right? So it's, it's kind of in my DNA. I love working with somebody that comes from maybe more of a financial background or operations background, and they've never even studied a sales technique. I love that challenge because I love them to find something within them to do that. You know, I really believe that everything you want is on the other side of fear. I don't know that, that where that quote came from, but I believe in that. You got to get past your anxiety and try it. So that is my preferred method is finding what works for you. So for some people, it is, you know, I've pre-crafted a message for them that they need to, you know, customize with a few things and they email it. Some people are very comfortable on the phone and would prefer to do nothing via email uh, a great place to start for folks that just aren't, they're just, oh, I don't know, uh, would actually be LinkedIn, sending a brief LinkedIn message to connect. So I just think there's a lot of tools available to fit the right personality. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair enough to say. Yeah. I, I, I think, too, that most people, let's use that word sales. Mm -hmm. um, now, I, I, I started my career excuse me, for the first eight years at in professional sales. Yeah. For, uh, 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 and sales, what most people think of sales, I think of car salesmen, yeah. <laughs> retail salespeople maybe. Right. right? And, you know, and just to keep this basic, yeah. sales is not telling. Sales is asking. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also doing, you know, research and mm -hmm. questioning. You know, um, so, you know, you're not going to talk and force a corporate sponsor into working with you. Right. You, you, right. You, 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 everything has to be aligned. Yes. Right. Yes. And, and they're going to want to work with you mm -hmm. if you show that your mission and their mission is, um, in, um, or are moving in the same direction. Yeah. Um, so I, you, like you said, you're an extrovert. I'm an extrovert to me, you know, I'm willing to walk away yes. all the time yes. from a sale. Yes. If I think that, Hey, this isn't the right product for you or this yes. isn't the right service for you. Um, and so I think that, that I'm trying to illustrate here to our listeners that it isn't, a slimy thing right. to call on on uh, uh, cor corporations to ask for sponsorships. Um, do you find that when you are talking to executive directors that they are more in the telling mode than they are in the asking question mode? Excellent question. Yes. <laughs> and that's mm. where I come in. You know, that's where I really help. You know, I mentioned earlier that one of the biggest mistakes I see is that people tend to say way too much. And I think it's because a lot of people think I've got this one chance to make this impression, but you can't see it that way. As I said earlier, you have to see this as step one in a journey. 
corporations are used to having multiple meetings before something happens. So they're, they're not expecting in this first meeting to make a commitment or on this first call, even to, you know, scope everything out that could be a possibility. It's really just to, you know, to generate interest. So I, I think that's the thing to, to really focus on. But yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, really having the skill set to start changing how you're approaching when you're, when you're in that meeting or on a call, asking more about what their needs are, what their interests are versus just kind of a deep dive into what your organization is. Absolutely. Yeah. I, um, so let's take a scenario where you recently either coach somebody yeah. or maybe when, you know, looking back and when you actually call for a corporate sponsorship yourself mm-hmm. and I'm not saying we have to role play it, but tell me how the call went. Wow, I do a lot. So I'm I'm trying to think. Uh, he, I hear here's what I would say: the more specific you can get with your connection, the the with the organization, the better your chance is that you're going to get a meeting or a next meeting. So let me give you an example with that. I am working with a large nonprofit that does work within the veterinary community. Okay. And there is a corporate, there's a corporation that has a corporate foundation that has an interest in doing anything to assist veterinarians in providing spay and neuter options in low income areas. Okay. My client was also interested in putting a program together that did the same, that did that same thing with some of its, you know, community in various parts of the United States. So knowing what I know about the corporation and their foundation and knowing what I know about my client, I was able to make a call and approach the executive director of the corporate foundation and specifically say, I'm an advisor working with this nonprofit. Here's specifically what I want to see if we can have an introductory conversation about. And then I I talked about the synchronicities that I saw, what they were doing with spay and neuter and what my nonprofit client was looking to do. Because I was able to make that very specific connection, we were able to get a meeting on the books in that conversation in a first call. So that is a great example of the more specific you can get, the better. And to give you to give you another example, you know, going back to food to food insecurity, you're going to have more luck talking about um, food insecurity affecting women and children versus talking about we work to help eradicate food insecurity in the Chicagoland area. When you talk about food insecurity with, amongst women and children, that's a very specific demographic to help within food insecurity. That's what that's what companies are looking for. So to be as specific as possible on a call or on a first email, your chances of getting that next step really increase. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. I, I, I'd be a little concerned about getting so specific that somebody might say um, that you might then get automatically someone saying, no, that's not what we're looking for. We're going right. We're going in this direction. Is that good to know that? Well, or is it- yeah, that's where the research comes in up front. Yeah. Because what I find, at least in my experience, they want to do things that are similar to what they've already done or in the same sandbox of things. Right. So I was very confident going in that because they had an interest in funding spay and neuter and I had a client that has a, has a program where they want to do it, that there was going to be a match. So, but to your point, not everyone is, you know, this isn't always cookie cutter. So you have to kind of look in your research. And if you see that there is a potential corporate sponsor, that's doing a lot of different things, then maybe you want to get a little more general um, in in what you're in what you're contacting about, but still there needs to be a relevant connection. You uh, 
The people who uh, are ahead of those foundations, mm-hmm. uh, the people who are running them, we, we're typically what is their background? Yeah. So what, here's what's really interesting that's going on specifically with corporate foundations. I'm starting to see a lot of executive directors of the corporate foundation also taking on the role of executive vice president of CSR, corporate social responsibility, or they're also overseeing the company's DEI efforts. Um, in the, up until a few years ago, those used to be really separate. And I'm starting to see more of a merger of the main contact. And what I like about that, especially for executive directors, is that's two separate pots of money because corporate philanthropy and corporate social responsibility they have their own budgets. So if you've got one person you're talking to, they can start to calculate in their mind where that money could come from. So um, that doesn't really answer the initial, I think the initial question, but they, th- in terms of where, you know, what is their background like? You either see people coming into corporate philanthropy who've already run nonprofits in the nonprofit area, but there's also a totally separate opposite side of the spectrum, where we're seeing people that have been engaged in corporate America for a long, long periods of time in community relations, public affairs, legal affairs, and even finance, taking the heads of, of, of executive directorship of corporate foundations. So that those that's kind of what I'm seeing right now. Yeah, my, my instinct is not only to do the research on the corporation. Okay. So my instincts are to, all right, I want to do the, and this is because I'm a business minded person, but the, the first thing is to do, let, do I understand what the corporation does for a living? Yes. Do I understand what your strategic mission is Mm -hmm. from a business standpoint? Yes. Now, what do I, do I understand what the, the, uh, um, the, uh, foundations, mission is okay so yeah. then i'm going to understand that and now this is my next point my, my 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 point i'm trying to make then i need to understand the person that i'm going to be speaking mm-hmm. with what's their background yes mm-hmm. because yeah. if if someone is like that is a prior executive director at a variety of these different mm-hmm. um nonprofits, yeah my approach might be a little different than somebody who is who comes from the corporate ranks. That's exactly of, right. Of, <laughs> yeah, because you know, so because the, honestly, those people who are corporate ranks often might be a little bit more business oriented. Yeah. Versus mm-hmm. the people who have been executive directors who are much more philanthropic oriented. Um, I, I don't know how I would approach it differently. I just know that certainly more information is better than less information. And that's where LinkedIn is great. I find that yeah. more people are talking about themselves on LinkedIn and they'll also talk about what they're interested in hearing about, you know, or they'll talk about these are the things I need. And that's a, that's a great, that's great prep work for your meeting. Yeah. So one of the best salespeople I ever had was, um, at another company uh, was she would do so much research before she picked up the phone. Mm-hmm. And I was, I would always be like, just, that's great, but you got to dial the phone too. And right. I'm not suggesting that I'm actually suggesting the opposite. I, I think that when it comes to this type of call, you, you do have to do the research really before you pick up that phone yes. and the better you do your research, the better the likelihood is. Plus you're not wasting your time as That's well. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'll give you, we have, we only have a, a, a minute left. Um, give us, give us a, a, a good uh, walk away or something to think about from what we've discussed in regards to, you know, corporate sponsorships. I really want people to take away the power of brevity. I can't express this enough in your communications. Just think about when you get a 400, 500 word email, what you want to do with it. (laughs) So really being really structured in your words and crafting something that's 200 words or less or crafting a voicemail that's, you know, 30 seconds or less just to be very compelling enough that they want to keep talking to you. That's your goal. All good stuff. 
Well, that's all the time we have for today. I'd like to thank so very much Lori uh, Zoss from Growth Al LLC for coming on today's podcast. And if you like today's podcast, please feel free to share it with a friend and also subscribe on your favorite podcasting app. The Nonprofit MBA podcast is now in the top 1% of podcasts for the nonprofit space. It's, you know, it's great. I think I have close to 300 or something like that episodes. And if you like today's podcast, please also give us a five-star review. Um, it really helps us get the word out. And of course, if you're looking for a line of credit for your nonprofit, please feel free to visit our website at nonprofitmbapodcast.com. Lori, if anyone wants to get in touch with you, how would they go about doing that? You could check out my website, thegrowthowl.com or drop me a message on LinkedIn. Great. Thanks for coming on today. Thank you. So the recording of this podcast is November 30th of 2023. So we're coming to the end of the year. And I always end the podcast this way. But I want to thank our listeners, not so much for being listeners. Thank you for doing that. But but for trying to help to make the world a better place. Um, there, there almost feels like there's never a day that doesn't go by where you, you know, there's major issues going on. And every day... Um, you guys are out there trying to make the world a better place. And I really thank you for that. However, I just want to remind you that you are no good to your family, your friends, your employees, and your cause if you burn out. And so the first thing you need to be doing every single day is taking care of yourself. And rather that's meditating, exercising, eating right, whatever it is that you need to do to to be good because, you know, saving the world is a marathon. It's not a sprint. So just keep that in mind. Again, thank you for listening and please continue to listen. We have so many great guests in, in our past history and new ones always coming up. So have a great day, everybody. We'll see you later.